Today on Nova Legends Podcast, I have Beth Leisure Hudson, a, a performance cyclist coach, a professional cyclist herself, um, and a master's racer. Uh, she's racing for my old team, Artemis, and so I'm excited to talk uh, cycling today. Uh, Beth, uh, nice to meet you. Thanks for doing this. Thanks, Julian, for having me. I really appreciate you and, and the opportunity to talk today. Oh, of course. Well, you know, I, I, I went through your, your, your background and uh, it's, it's fascinating. You have a lot of interesting theories of coaching. You're not just the normal, normal coach. And also, you know, with your ex experience, um, you know, you were, you were racing bicycles at a time when there wasn't that many females racing. I'm sure that at, at least here in America, uh, there wasn't very, very many African-Americans racing. I know when I, when I was right. racing in the late nineties, early two thousands, there wasn't very many. Now there's, there's more, a lot more females, especially. So I'm sure you have a lot of interesting things to tell us. Let me just uh, give you a short um, sketches of your bio. You're 85 graduate of American university. Yes. Uh, later on, you got a master's degree at Eastern Michigan university in, in um, exercise uh, physiology. Um, yes. You, you're a UCI um, sports director, sporting director, um, which, um, you know, um, regulates, uh, such positions worldwide. Um, you're a USA cycling certified, uh, skills instructor. Um, let me see. You're a, uh, uh, at one, at one place I saw you describe yourself as a, a bene benevolent dictator <laughs> as a coach. And that was at your, on your Johns Hopkins website, which is, uh. is and also you, you, um, part of your coaching is through Christian, um, uh, motivation. Um, my, my, I'm the son of, of a Baptist minister, the grandson of a Baptist minister, great oh, grandson, sorry. also a nephew. <laughs> they, they would probably tell you that I fell far from the tree, but, <laughs> but anyway, did I get most of that right, Beth? You did. Um, uh, you said you fell, you have fallen far from the tree of the Baptist. Well, I'm sure tree. to them I have, I am not a minister and they all were, but, uh, I, I do my best. Well, I think, I think it's good to have uh, a continual awareness and enlightenment as you grow in your faith and, mm -hmm. and move away from designations like Baptist and become more universal in the way you think. Well, uh, I, I you know, have as a coach as an and an athlete. Well, see, I would say the same, same thing to my father, uh, my late father, but uh, he, he would consider that kind of squishy. You know, I would say dad, I'm more huh. spiritual. I really, in, he, you know, he's a kind of, he's a fire brim, brimstone type. You, you have to choose yep. one or the other. So that's, so the, yeah, I, I'm probably that, more that, on your side of it. Huh? That dualistic thinking came from St. Augustine. It was not actually the thinking of the desert fathers and the, and the current mystics. Um, and you'd like to think that knowledge is increasing and that knowledge of even the way to apply your faith is increasing. So rather than it being squishy, I would call it more expansive maybe a little more enlightened yeah a little less rigid yeah well look uh, we're, we're on the same side so there, there's, a, there's a minister uh carlton pearson and i i i when my when my father passed i wanted we were gonna we we're gonna sing his favorite song at the funeral and um i went on youtube to find some versions of it and this this minister named carlton pearson has this amazing version of um uh by and by, we we will understand it better by and by. Exactly. So I got to know yeah. a little bit about his preaching, and he was a Baptist preacher as well. And then, or maybe he's Pentecostal. And then, but one day he decided that uh, there was no heaven and hell; everyone went to heaven. And yes. at that point, he was excommunicated, and his life I afterwards think he just was read very... his obituary this week. Yeah, he just died like a week ago, two weeks ago. Yes, yes, yes. I just read about him. That's so interesting. Yeah, he was a fascinating I... guy. A pioneer in 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 the in any faith movement, certainly in Christianity, as a Black American, making his congregation more diverse. Yeah. Uh, and he didn't do that for appeal. He did that because he he had an enlightenment and he and he felt more expansive in the way he was thinking. Yeah, I mean, as you probably know, church church as, as Malcolm X used to say. Uh, uh, noon on Sunday is the most segregated hour in America, and churches have always been very segregated, yeah. especially yeah. the Black Church and well, both mm. both churches. And he his church was very diverse and mm. young and old, uh, Black and white, Latino, 
all the above. He did yeah. believe in that. He did try to innovate, but sometimes- And the LGBTQ, did I say that right? LGBTQ community as well. Was as well, yeah. In his congregation, it, yeah. And a lot of times you, you get a lot of pushback. To, and at times when you try to, to implement faith in your coaching, have you gotten a lot of pushback? Um, no, not really. Um, I, in the early days when I was younger and I was more zealous, perhaps like your father, more rigid in the way I thought more of a, let's call me a Bible thumper, perhaps, um, maybe then, but certainly not now. I work with all kinds of people, even people who don't believe or come out or even people internationally who come out of systems that who were definitely taught not to believe. And um, even those folks see the value of faith, they might see it differently. They might call it um, mental skill or psychology, but I don't think God really calls, cares of what name you use for God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you want to call psych God psychology, it's okay with me. <laughs> if you had, um, if you had uh, athletes, especially when you work with young athletes and you're dealing with their parents, that if that have said, "Well, we really don't want to do much with faith. We, you know, we believe in something else. Can we, can we, can we do the coaching, but not incorporate that into our coaching?" Well, I of course, um, I I read every situation. I don't necessarily incorporate faith mm. with every. I I don't I. Let me put it this way. I don't preach to anyone, I don't think, uh, through words or or my ideologies uh, about what to believe. Um, I just try to teach principles and values that are effective. And I don't I've never had any pushback with that. Um, I've had pushback when I was perhaps not executing those principles and values myself as well as as I was at uh, I set a high standard and sometimes my parents hold me to a higher standard than I'm even able to execute because I'm a human being too. Mm -hmm. um, so I've had pushback with that more than anyth anything, just, um, you know, personality or communication failings more than faith. Is there something about cycling and the suffering and the um, cycling is a, is a, is a very people who've never done it before probably don't understand the, the psychological battle with yourself, with your teammates, with your comp opponents. There's a lot that goes into it. Oh, so it's very much. hard to explain. Is there something yeah. about um, cycling that makes it particularly um, conducive to um, to faith as as coaching? Like you, and you do see faith a lot in football. If you if you watch, yeah, you watch you high school football in the South, or you'll see these these lawsuits every once in a while where a parent complains because the coach is is, is using prayer. And, and 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 things you do see that, but anyway, is there anything special about cycling? Do you think that's particularly conducive to to faith? Um, well, let's be clear. Like I, I'm I'm not a Baptist minister, and I have never been that way in my approach. So I wouldn't pray. I would. I don't necessarily pray with my athletes, or even ask them to. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm I'm more Franciscan, perhaps, in the way that I approach it, which is. Just live, live the principles and the values and the beliefs and don't talk about them too much or certainly don't push practices. Now, I want everyone to have high moral standards uh, in the way they perform and how they perform and how they conduct themselves. And uh, there's there's been some hard conversations around that, even the use of social media, let's say, and the idea of pride. Um, young people in particular need an element of pride in their performance and, 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 and preparation around performance because they're in the first half of life where ego development is so important psychologically. So we have to really balance that with this danger of comparison and caring too much what other people think um, with getting the truth out and getting the truth to them facing the reality it doesn't help someone to continue to do to 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 do a a bad habit let's say or um an unmastered skill that continually is tripping them up and others um 
if you don't get them the truth and that that's sometimes hard in a teenage or u twenty u twenty three context without uh kind of overstepping the ego development boundary so it's like a balance so that for me that's one of the biggest challenges is is delivering the truth like a benevolent dictator but also um having the meaning come across because I'm pretty direct and um having the meaning come across in the right context and I think sometimes uh I've not been successful because I haven't understood the context that the person is seeing me in somebody who knows me well or has interacted with me a lot should know that I am never giving hard advice out of bitterness or anger or violence even if I'm my voice is raised and I'm being direct. And I think that's the biggest challenge uh, in coaching is that communication piece is, you know, I don't want to be that stereotypical, angry 1950s football coach. Yeah. But I want those hard 1950s, angry football coach messages to be heard, Mm -hmm. you know? So when you say benevolent dictator, um, are you a tough coach? Um, so today's coaching, and I interview a lot of coaches, mostly basketball, soccer, and football. Um, mm-hmm. But mo- mostly today's coaches complain that they can't be too tough. If they're tough, they get they, they hear pushback from parents, mostly team sports I'm, t- I'm talking about. They get pushback from, from parents, the administration. Um, they have a hard time delivering the truths that you talk about in terms of a, a person's weaknesses and, and strengths. Um, so, so do you consider yourself a tough coach? Um, I, I just, uh, lost my picture of you, but there you are. Oh. Um, sorry. Um, sorry. yeah, I think I'm a tough coach and I think, I think I, I think I get away with it because I take so much time to build a relationship. And when I don't get away with it, the relationship has somehow, uh, been compromised either through external voices or um, misunderstanding. Um, and so then I have to, I have to backpedal and reestablish, reestablish that trust and that connection, or I have to decide this person, this is not a teachable moment for this person, either for me or for me right now. Uh, so yeah, I think it's I think it's almost easier to be tough when you're honest about it. And uh, but you have to spend time building that connection and building mm-hmm. that trust and being an ally. You know, they have to know that you are the you are their warrior advocate if you're going to also give them a tough message. Mm-hmm. They also have to know that you care about them. Mm-hmm. And that might be hard and harder in group sports where you have a lot of people you have to do that with. Um, or it may be harder for, I don't want to say it's harder by gender because I think that's a little discriminatory. It may be harder for some personalities than others to to do that. But we all know like, we all know that like soup Nazi Kai, we have one in our town. He He sells coffee and he's, just gritty and harsh and 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 Billy Goat Gruff, he calls himself, but he is the most tender hearted person. So yeah, I guess, you know, but, you know, I can take it. And I, I think the athlete and the parents has to decide, well, what are you willing to, 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 to absorb? Do you want, do you want performance? If so, that comes with a cost and that's hard truths. Because look, performance isn't linear. It's not on a perfectly increasing, increasing, increasing timeline. It's undulating. That's the nature of physiological adaptation. It's it's train and improve. And then that graph drops. There's a regression, a rest, a plateau, whatever you want to call it. Even if you, Even if the work remains the same, if you don't lay off and die, quote unquote, regress, you can't transform or resurrect to have that next level of linear increase. So yeah. there's a cost and and every athlete has to has to pay that cost. And that's not that's not a reflection of talent 
as much as it is facing reality. And so it's easy to hear the truth when things are going well and things aren't going well. What truth are you giving them? Mm -hmm. You know, is it, is it, is it too tough to hear? Like you don't want to, you don't want to bruise a broken, someone who's broken uh, already because their performance has been suffering for some time that that's not effective. I think I, I think I'm tough, but I'm tough. Uh, periodized or undulating because that's that's the pattern of physiology that's the rhythm of physiology but I believe that's the rhythm of life and I think that's the model that Christ really was trying to say is my life is me I exist I decide to die I am resurrected this is a pattern it's a it's a pattern for agriculture where you plant a seed, it dies, and then something new comes up. It's a pattern in physiology. It is the pattern in quantum physics. This is this is the universal pattern. Hmm. And uh, training and performance and coaching needs to be in that rhythm, I believe. Well, you know, when we talk about toughness and coaching, you know, what context are we usually talking about? Is this like, is it generally you're, you're tough and getting the athlete to, to train the way they need to train. Could it be diet, being more disciplined? Could it be the tactics in a race? Um, you know, what what are some of the, what are some of the contexts do you find yourself being tough to the athlete? Well, I I don't really find myself being tough. I I only hear that I'm tough. <laughs> For me, I'm just being kind of me. But I I taught a, a skills clinic recently, and um, and it was uh it was a uh, 90% men and 10% women, let's say. And um, all were people of color. And I only say that because uh, we mentioned how, how neat it is that, that our sport has gotten more diversified. Mm -hmm. And um, I uh, worked on skills with, the, with, with the, this group. And at the end, and I worked three different weekends with them. And at the end, I asked for feedback and uh, several of the guys said, you know, we, I, my pride was hurt when I first started working with you. They, he said, they, the, a few of them said sort of along the, these lines, they said, we thought we were really skilled until you started teaching us skills. And I was really shocked because I don't recall being all that tough or, um, or I, and I really was never trying to be to hurt anyone's pride. Um, it's just though it's just the way I come across. Like I'm not going to let you be sloppy or unsafe in one of my skills clinics. Like you, you better get it right because <laughs> yeah. it's right. it's your skin and everybody around you, and and it's your performance long term. Yeah. Well. I want to get back to your coaching, but I want to ask you, how did, how did you get into cycling in the first place? That's a long story. I, I'll, I'll try to give you an abbreviated version. I, I used it um, to recover from some, from a traumatic experience I had as a young woman. Somebody told me to exercise that it would make me feel better. And part of what I was part of the trauma I was dealing with had to do with loss of financial resources. And so um, I just used this big old heavy Schwinn that was in my parents' barn and I rode it like 15 minutes the first day. And I thought that was really something, but I could feel how good it was for my soul. And then I uh, suddenly I just started meeting people and they were encouraging and I, I and I learned that it was a sport and I was in my late twenties at this point I didn't even know it was really a sport and um, and that's how I got into it and of course at that point I was um, needing more external affirmation uh, about my path and I got that affirmation. I got it through encouragement to race. I got it through um, financial support. I got it through spiritual support. Uh, I mean, I I had that epiphany, that hand writing on the wall, that lightning in the sky moment spiritually that told me that this was my path. Hmm. 
So when did you realize that you're pretty good at this and you could eventually become a professional? Well, um, so I was being helped locally. I had that real heavy bike and then somebody locally got me another bike. It was a, it was a, it was a step up, but it was still a touring bike that weighed a lot. And, uh, I did that because that, or the local club had helped me so much. They ran a time trial at the end of the summer and they, they kind of insisted that I do it. And I didn't really want to, but I felt sort of obligated because they'd been providing me all this support and this, this bicycle and stuff. So I did it. And I broke the course record. And so for women, of course, and, um, and it wasn't, it was pretty competitive with the men too. And so then we did this, um, trip to the big city bike shop. And, uh, there I met a female mechanic who was running a 12 week race skills clinic. And I got involved in that clinic and, and then it became clearer and clearer, you know, there was a, there was a level of ability. Um, and that's when I, and the bike shop owner, uh, uh gave me a, a used bicycle, another, it was another major upgrade. It was a, it was an Italian racing bicycle that had been crashed. So it wasn't perfect, but, um, it was a major upgrade from the touring bike I was using. And so I had a, a, a new rate, uh, a new to me race bicycle, a club to race with and skills and, and, uh, and the rest is sort of history, but it wasn't easy. I mean, I remember getting dropped literally out of the parking lot in the first training event because it's just racing is different than training. And I was really getting discouraged. And, um, I, I prayed at that time, like, I thought I heard you God, like, I need some, I need some evidence if this is, this is my path. And in my seventh race, I was starting to get dropped or fall off the pace and a dog ran onto the course and slowed the leaders down no. catch at that moment. And, and I finished seventh and in Christianity, that that's like a big number. Seven is the number of perfection and like stamp of approval. So to me, that was my sign that I was to continue. And it was, it's always been like that. Julian, for me, it's always been not instant or total domination. It's always been work hard, see an opportunity, seize it, success, plateau, maybe regress, maybe an injury or crash, maybe a, the loss of sponsorship, work hard, see an opportunity, seize it, success. It, it's the same pattern of life, death, reborn that's the kind of athlete i am well how did you end up in europe because you raced in europe europe for a while didn't you yeah yeah um by desire um i wrote to the federations of several countries the ones that responded um i went to and raced on the license raced on a license from those different federations and that in both countries, they in all three countries, they assigned me coaches, and I had, and then I partnered with organizations, um, actually Christian mission organizations, in order to help me finance it, and also some private sponsorship, um, and some corporate sponsorship. So I cobbled it together and just made it happen. Yeah. So you raced for a while and 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 you come you came back to the United States. And is that when you got into coaching? No, not right away. Um I sort of got into coaching because of one of the one of somebody who was helping sponsor me had a junior daughter and he asked me to help her. And so I did. And, and that was the first person I worked with. And then um Later, the first the first person that I worked with officially was an African American from the DMV hmm. who asked me for help with his collegiate team. Hmm. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, I bet you I know. I was, him. What I said, I bet you I know him because I was racing you, about that time. You probably do. Yeah. Um, Diane Harris and Tony Harris. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I know them. They're they're Artemis Artemis too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so they were the first. They were my first 
really official clients. And I, and I think that is just so great. Wow. Yeah. Well, so when you, when you, when you got in, when you got into coaching, um, you know, did, did you, did you see the, um, the opportunity in it? Cause I, I would have thought at the time, uh, so I was racing around again, around 2000, 2003 was probably my best, my peak of my racing. I was racing almost every weekend, but I, I didn't really see the opportunity there because, you know, at the time, um, you know, Lance Armstrong had broken through, was winning the Tour de France. Um, and, you know, America was cycling crazy, but there wasn't a domestic, really a domestic pro scene. So, and then, you know, there wasn't like a really a, much of a junior scene at all. So if you're, if you're a parent and you want your, get your kids into activities, you probably wouldn't choose cycling. So how did you see the, the opportunity in coaching cycling? Um, well, there was a small domestic pro scene. Mm -hmm. um, there was a small uh, domestic junior scene. In fact, Lance Armstrong helped finance a junior series that was pretty robust at one time. Mm. Um, um, and Greg LeMond had done that before him. Some uh, had at least created a wave of juniors that were interested in the sport mm -hmm. through his success. Um, so there was a small group like that. But I wasn't making decisions based on on opportunity like you mean it. I was making decisions based on small moments to influence, not not a way to make a robust living. I had already decided back when I was moving from the heavy Schwinn to the to the better touring bike to the broken Italian race bike that my journey wasn't about financial resources or success in the traditional way of looking at it. I'd already, I'd already started to look at this path as mission. And you, you got a master's degree uh, much later at, at Eastern Michigan. How important was that to your coaching? Did you learn a lot that you're able to to provide to your to your clients? I did. I learned so much. I, I learned what happened was I would attend coaching conferences and the physiologists were just talking way over my head. And I hate, <laughs> I hate feeling like the idiot in the room, you know? So this opportunity presented itself. And the guy that led the program is a stellar physiologist in endurance sports with a cycling connection. And I just couldn't refuse. It was such a tremendous opportunity and uh and and that program just opened worlds for me i mean it's it's i i'm a, i think i'm a better athlete now even though i'm 60 than i was when i you know 35 years ago because i'm training for my physiology and my phenotype with more knowledge um and i had good coaches don't don't hear me don't hear me you know say anything disparaging about them but the information at our fingertips now is is a is a lot more robust and a lot more readily available and i and i get it i finally get it <laughs> who, who are your first like role models or mentors in coaching i mean i remember when around that time chris carmichael was putting out these these uh training programs that he was affiliated with armstrong and so coaching was beginning to get big people were getting we're getting coaching. I, the guys, who, the people that got coaching were, were taking off. You can see them leaving the Peloton pretty quickly. So, but who were your first role models? Um, it wasn't Chris Carmichael, although I respect what he, what he has done for coaching in America. Um, it was more uh, some folks that preceded him one and they were a team at that time, Dean Golich and Dave Morris. Um, they were the first ones to, to utilize the power meter in America. They had an import exclusive with SRM back when it was first invented. And it was through them that I, I was one of the first users of power in this country, um, just under the national team level. I was one of the first. So, and I was doing it under their direction. Um, and then the other, the other people that were influential to me were other riders that just came alongside me for periods of time and helped like Alexi Graywall, like Michael Carter, uh, like, um, 
uh, Marilyn Wells in Colorado, uh, who rode for the Canadian national team. Um, and there were others. Uh, I, if anybody's listening, uh, please don't feel left out. But those are the they, those were the first early three riders that had a lot of influence on me. Yeah. Well, when you when you think about how coaching has evolved, um, you know, I, I, I haven't I haven't paid much attention to cycling the last when I I stopped when my second child was born in two thousand five, and I, you know I go out and ride my bike. I I live near you. I live in Lansdowne, so I'm I'm probably. 20 miles from you as a crow, as a crow flies. So uh -huh. it's, it's beautiful riding. So I'll go out there and I ride and I, I'm, I can still ride you know, pretty strong, but I don't, I don't, I don't care about, you know, uh, training programs. I just ride for fun now, but how is, how has training changed through the years? I, I mean, you talked about power meters. I remember Watts was a big deal. And, um, but what, how has training changed over the last 20 years? Oh, the training has changed so much there. Uh, it's hard to, to answer that quickly mm -hmm. I, I would say the biggest the biggest thing the biggest influence has been power i mean we're 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 incredibly fortunate in our sport that we have an indirect way to measure physiological systems that are that's much more precise than using a heart rate monitor or a stopwatch uh and that and because we have that it's 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 moved it's moved our, the knowledge at, along so much so much faster i think than other sports in that respect um so i would say that i would say the another thing is just the amount of information the computers and the internet has provided uh, you know what percentage of that is misinformation probably a big percent but you know everyone can throw a re there were certain pioneers like carmichael uh, like Hunter Allen, like, um, uh, a Andy, um, Coggin, uh, who, um, who standardized the language for using power. Um, and as a result of that, it, it put, it put information into the hands of the people and then and then also the hands of a lot of experts worldwide. So um, we've had a lot of uh, studies uh, worldwide that it's had an in in impact. It's funny though, at the pro level, there's a lot of old wives tales and um, myths that they still use. Um, and, and they are sort of the last to, to innovate because what's worked for them and the tradition, um, you know, it's hard to argue with someone who's winning the Tour de France about what's the best the best train me training method. Even though maybe you know, maybe you think as a physiologist, if if that person would do this, they'd have they'd get this much more percentage. Uh, what's always worked is a is a hard argument when you're dealing with the with the elite. But um, so I would I would say. Pro cycling is not who's driven a lot of the innovation. Uh, pro cycling has utilized the innovation and of course has the resources to to grow the innovation, but pro cycling isn't isn't who has really pushed it. The it's been the grassroots and a lot and the national teams and anyone trying to get an advantage uh sort of under the pro level that's driven a lot of the innovation. Yeah. Well, you know, in, in football, most of the innovation happens at the high school level because there's so many high school football games around around the country, and a lot of the innovation moves up upward in the college and pro. The, co the high school is kind of like the petri dish in some regards, so that gets probably similar to uh, uh, to what you're talking about. Now, I know you you focus on coaching women, or at least on your website, but I'm sure you can coach male athletes. We're all we're all trying to. Uh, I we'll, am. We'll have some, I I'm sorry. I mean, the reality is financially, I, I, I do coach male athletes and I right. am going to continue because the ratio is like five to one male to female. So is there, is there a big difference um, coaching a male athlete uh, as opposed to the female athlete? I wouldn't call it a big difference, but I would say there is a difference. Women aren't small men. Uh, junior girls aren't junior boys. Their development timeline is different the the approach is different their physiology is a little different uh 
And then of course there are hormonal differences for sure. Mm -hmm. And those hormonal differences are on a different timeline. So there is some different, there are some differences, um, but there are some, there are some differences that are not gender specific that just come down to personality too. Yeah. And, and do you enjoy coaching uh, males as, as well as female, or is it the same enjoyment for a coach? Yeah. I mean, I, I love, I love coaching a teachable talent. Who doesn't? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, and, and when you're, when you're dealing with, with um, young cyclists, uh, do you, do you have a lot of, tough conversations around uh the safety of the sport now one of the things um i was probably a talented cyclist but i would hang out in the back of the pack i wanted nothing to do with the peloton and then i would move up the last lap and i and usually i could do pretty well because i was strong but i i wanted nothing no parts of that peloton or crashes or anything um yeah. because the games you know it was like a bloodbath every weekend and, I, and and that was one of the main reasons why i got out of got out of cycling but do you, do you do you talk to people about the, the danger of, of cycling? Is that is that a, is that a stopping point for you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's what what one of the things I teach in my skills clinics is uh, a way to approach that danger, because each the, the the races have a rhythm. They're like divided like a a great classical masterpiece. They're they're lot they're divide the a race is divided into different acts or rhythms and i call that segmentation and each one of those rhythms ha had requires a different skill to meet that particular athletic demand so what you're describing um i i wouldn't i'd have you out of that situation very quickly because you need the skill to know how to be in that mix at the front in order to be safe being at the back does not guarantee you safety and sometimes sometimes it's scarier back there than it is at the front uh it sounds to me what you lacked and here's my benevolent dictator about to speak truth to you is some knowledge and some skill and some accountability in addition to uh a program that's manageable for you to to go from novice to intermediate to advance to mastering it yeah, I mean, I think I was a few points away from the cat too. I was, you know, I did well, but um, the problem is you have to fight for a position and I'm too polite. And people, I would let people in and, and it's hard. And back then, I'm sure it's like that now, most of the local races were crits. So I, I would just pick out road races, like really tough road races. And I would, ones that were really tough. And I would, I would just follow the big moves. And I could always, you know, do well in those types of races, but crits, you have to be in the top three or four, like Dave Osborne. Every every race you see, he's in he's in the third wheel every time. I don't know how he gets there, but he's he's always there. I can never get there. So when someone wants that spot, I'm polite. You know, I just, it just and that's my, a seri that's a series of skills, Julian. It's not one thing. I mean, yeah. Super Dave is Super Dave. He he's a he's a big engine, but it's 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 having the engine at the right moment yeah. and the and learning that timing. And what skills you need for each one of the acts of that play. Right. It's skills. Just like if someone said, you know, Beth, uh, let's let's run um, some kind of football play. I'd be like, what? You know, but if I would have started playing football when I was seven and I learned all those steps, I could execute that pro play. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're talking about. Yeah. And being a being near a cat too doesn't guarantee that you will have learned those skills. No, no, because I was, I was, I was just, I was strong, but I knew nothing about racing. But I was able to, you know, I was still a strong rider, so I was able to to get my results when I needed it. But you know, most of the big races, I would frustrate the uh, uh, God Ar Artemis. What was the woman's name? Ev. I would frustrate yeah. her because I wouldn't do any of the crits around here that were, you know, the high profile. I would travel to oh. North Carolina and. One of my um, toughnesses, I'll give you a good example, is you don't get to cat up until you learn certain skills, because guess what? Those skills become harder the higher level you go. Yeah. If you don't learn the fundamentals in the when the categories are easier, how in the world are you going to get that when the categories are harder and your peers are all better, faster, and stronger? 
And so I would not have let you cat up to three until as a five or a four, you would have mastered certain things that, so you, many, are then, go ahead, I'm that sorry. you are then comfortable with. Yeah. So I saw so many riders just get caught up in these crashes throughout the years. And I mean, that for, to survive, you know, men, there's a hundred, hundred back then, at least I don't know about now, there'd be a hundred uh, racers in a four or five, I mean, they were just absolute bloodbaths. And so you, you, to, to escape to three was, a, a you know, a, a, an achievement in itself. Uh, and then, you know, the Masters was was much more steady and much more, you know, I, I felt more comfortable in Masters. Is it still the same way that today the Masters racing is probably the safer uh, type of racing? Um, It can be. It depends how skilled you are. Because, again... Mm -hmm. Uh, there are new new people coming into the master's categories who don't necessarily have the skills. So, um, and it can be strong. So, yeah. yeah, it can be. Yeah. So, so um, is most of your coaching internet based, or are you in you in person? Are you there at the races and you're you're talking to tactics, or or do you do a combination of both? Combination training program. Uh, delivery and monitoring maintenance is all online. I do Zoom meetings regularly, but I'm pretty hands-on and I get race side with every one of my athletes at various times throughout the season. Right. And you're you're in Shepherdstown, which is beautiful. Have you always lived lived there? Uh, for, I've lived here about 14 years. Yeah. And, and you, so you, as most of the, your riding uh, that you do yourself is out there on those, on those country roads or do you come in the city, to, uh, near the city to ride? I train here, but I also come into the city to do big group rides. Yeah, come all the way, okay. Um, and also, I, I know you coach the Johns Hopkins team. Do you prefer team coaching, individual coaching? And does it matter, uh, you know, whether it's college or like a uh, club? Um, I also worked with pro teams. Pro team. oh, um, I'm sorry, yeah. I think... Uh, it's not a, it's not so much a preference, uh, as it, as it is, um, what's going on in your life. It's hard to do teams and individuals at the same time and give the same amount of quality to both, both sets. Uh, people do it, um, it depends what level the team is in order to, for it to be successful. I don't have a preference, I guess. I I love working uh, live with people though. I love doing clinics and I love doing the team team director stuff. Um, but the, co the individual co coaching has a lot of rewards too, especially when you're race side and you've worked ye sometimes years toward a, toward a goal event and then you're there and the, and the, the athlete is executing it's it's awesome yeah i think it, that probably applies to all all types of coaching all sports yeah um, what, what what is what's going on in cycling today is cycling healthy like i know for for example it's like a lot of gravel uh, racing back there was no gravel 20 years ago even though we had there's cyclocross but there's there's different types it's, you know obviously it's mountain bikes there's there's your road racing and there's your, now your, your gravel and your cyclocross uh, is it healthy are we getting a lot of uh participants in the sport um, you know, I don't, I'm not, uh, I'm not completely up to date on the current demographics with membership in that, but I can tell you there's been a huge change away from road and more toward gravel. Um, and some of that's general generational and some of it may be as perhaps because of the doping scandals have, there's been, um, a ripple effect from some of the doping, uh, scandals that, saw a dearth of sponsorship because of lack of trust, uh, you know, obviously. Um, and so we're kind of paying a price for that. You know, you reap what you sow. And so road racing has sown a little bit of bad seed and has, has reaped a little bit of bad seed. Um, but, uh, and road racing is hard and more expensive to put on. Um, and the the current generation or the last generation of promoters was pretty risk adverse. So, oh, and the that generation is also 
a little bit anti-establishment, I think. And so that so this idea of gravel just chick, clicks all those boxes. It's not it's not fraught with all this tradition and all this doping history. It, you don't even need sponsorship. You don't necessarily have to have the same insurances and the amount of uh, road crew and marshalling for sa the safety aspect on gravel. And so that's one reason why I think gravel really took off in America about 10 years ago. But honestly, I was at Gravel Worlds this year and at uh, the European Gravel Championships and America has lost the domination of gravel. Hmm. Europe's got it now. Right. So is, are cyclocross and gravel, right? It seems like those skills would be pretty transferable. So are they? No. No, it's not. No. No, I mean, there are certainly cyclocross enthusiasts who do gravel and vice versa, but there, but there are different skills. I mean, there's some similar similar off-road skills when you're on the bike, but there's no, there's not a lot of barrier, barrier hopping and stair running and that kind of thing on most gravel courses. Um, and same with mountain bike single track, there could be some mountain bike single track type stuff, but there's also a lot of road skill that comes into play in gravel because some of the, uh, cer certainly the hard starts it's it's large groups and there's some strategy involved yeah so okay and now this is a really stupid question beth but are gravel races peloton or are they like time trials i think you just they're mass start mm -hmm. okay mass start okay yeah it's so a big I'm... thundering herd at the beginning racing not toward a whole shot like in mountain biking or, or cyclocross but they could be racing toward a, a major feature that causes things to narrow maybe 20 miles down the road maybe five miles down the road so it's a big thundering herd in the beginning that requires a certain amount of skill and savvy and self-knowledge because you have to pace that hmm. so what what percentage of your clients are, are gravel um I don't have anybody who's just focused on gravel. Oh, okay. People, people who race gravel tend to race other types of, of disciplines as well. Is that, is that how uh, it works? Le what, how it's working with my athletes, the younger ones, especially um, they're doing everything. They have NICA for in high school. They have mountain bike racing in high school. They have um, road opportunities. They have gravel opportunities and, I think it's great because that multi multidisciplinary approach and they have cyclocross opportunities. That multidisciplinary approach is great when you're developing early and then later when you want to specialize, you can decide, but you've got all those different skill sets to apply. It's, yeah. it's pretty cool. Is the physiology the same? Um, for example, you know, time trellis, sometimes could be taller, longer, and leaner. They can be, whereas, you know, road, um, you know, for a hilly road, road races, um, it might be more uh, power type of, of riders. Do you have the same types of um, uh, differences of body types for gravel uh, racing as well, I, I would assume? There, yes, because they're different, uh, because there's no standardized gravel courses mm -hmm. yet. And so you could get, a fast flat gravel course, or you get a, a a mountainous gravel course. You can get something in between. So yeah, there there's all different kinds of physiologies that could play into that. However, that being said, gravel is uh, tends to be all out in the beginning. So it's almost it's almost like you're going VO two max to threshold to sweet spot, to tempo, mm -hmm. to endurance, to just try and whatever you've got left to finish. Um, and so it, it, so that's conducive to someone who's got a pretty big engine anyway, mm -hmm. aerobically and a lot of endurance. Yeah, that sounds like it'd be fun to watch from the start, which a lot of times cycling's not. A lot of times cycling, nothing, nothing really happens till later on. So it's, it's a little bit tough on the spectators because you can't really get to those those, those key uh, parts in in the course. 
I, I have I had a uh, interview with the Grand Fondo rider. Now, do you see? Is there are a lot of uh, riders picking up Grand Fondo and and um, Grand is that something Fondo that people is, train for with you as well? Yeah, yes, Grand Fondo has filled the road race space pretty nicely, uh, and there and the UCI um, puts on Grand Fondos in the in the Italian tradition of that word, which just means big root, which means it's a gun start race from start to finish. It's not time segments like some American Grand Fondos. Uh, and so that space of time start to finish has really filled the road race dearth very nicely and, mm -hmm. and has contributed to some really good aerobic base training for other for the other dif disciplines yeah. so that's been an interesting side effect of that yeah well look Beth, this this has been great uh meeting you i i, I could talk cycling with you all day um so i really appreciate your time uh la last question how long how much longer do you think you'll race for i i know you i i checked out your your record uh last year i think you won the um the copy uh james Belora's copy i used to i used to ride race with J against james so how much longer do you think you'll you'll uh, you race? I don't know. I I here's here's the thing, is aging is interesting. Uh, you don't know how well you're gonna do it. What you don't know how, what genetic health concerns will come up. Right now, I'm healthy or reasonably healthy, or the issues that I have are being well managed. Um. So, uh, I am actually. My lean mass is amazing. Uh, my strength to weight is is pretty impressive. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm this close. Like, I'm just off the podium at the world level. I was second at the European Gravel Championships this year. I was seventh at wor Gravel Worlds, 10th at Road Worlds. I'm just so close. And, um, I, and so I'm highly motivated. So... And the other thing is the reality. How long is my health going to be as, as it is? How long is my husband's health going to be as it is? I feel like I have to seize the day. And so I'm doing double world uh, road and gravel focus, um, focused on another Grand Fondo National Championship, a Masters National Championship. Um, yeah, I'm still all, all about it until I can't be, basically. Yeah. Is your is your husband a cyclist as well? He is, but recreationally. Okay. Yeah. And he's a I, tremendous provider, so he helps me that way. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I, I would think it would be tough to have two two cyclists and one two cyclists at your level in one family. I think some people do it, but um mm -hmm. yeah. Well we're we're we um our relationship is is mixed, I guess. <laughs> I have one of those too, in another way. Well, <laughs> let me tell you, you guys have a beautiful home, Beth. I saw a spectacular stone home. It was stunning. I bet you it's it's really beautiful this time of year with um, with the holiday decorations and stuff. But anyway, I, I hope you, you didn't mind me asking questions about your faith. I really enjoyed talking to you. And you. maybe one of these days we can go, we can actually go for a bike ride. And you can, Oh, that'd be great, Julian. Yeah, you can tell me how unfit I, I was for that Peloton in, um, in my racing days. Well, I would apply. I would try to apply my tough, my tough uh, dictator approach gently, and at the right moment. <laughs> exactly. Um, I'm sure I could take it. I, I, that would be a lot of fun. So, but anyway, this has been great. Maybe at some point we can talk again. But definitely would love to go for a ride with you at some point. Okay. Well, let me know. All right. It sounds good. Thanks again, Beth. Thank you. All right, you're Bye. Welcome. Bye. <laughs>